Mom, Dad, I humbly suggest you save some money and shop Amazon for back to school. It's for my growth, meaning my body's growing at an alarming rate. And clothes you buy me this year will be very small very soon. Plus, the clothes I love today will be out of style tomorrow. But at least your wallet doesn't have to be my fashion victim if you shop low prices for school at Amazon. Hopefully this is helpful. Amazon. Spend less, smile more. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Today, we're going to discuss OCPD, which most people don't even know is a real thing or have never heard of and frequently mistake for OCD. Uh, Before we get there, the next episode is going to be subscriber only, but I have not yet got jolted with inspiration for that one. So while I can assure you it will be fascinating, I don't know what the hell it will be. So why don't you just bet on it being good or that you'll like one of the other preceding 41 episodes and subscribe. Um, And also join my Facebook group always because a lot of people like to talk about stuff like OCPD and sex and whatever. Um, just kidding. I haven't done this one on OCPD yet, but I'm sure they'll be talking about it when I do. <laughs> um, anyhow, so what's OCPD? OCPD is, as you could tell from the title, when you are rigid as fuck. But wh- how can this manifest? So these are people that get really into like rules, moral codes, really any kind of code. They are into doing the right thing in the right way at the right time. And this often makes them insufferable. So this is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So there's various clusters of personality disorders or there used to be. I don't know if we do that anymore. It doesn't really matter in my job. I'm in private practice. <laughs> DSM could be whatever, you know, but the, the, it used to be that there was cluster A, which is the weird personality disorders, the ones where you're kind of odd and you don't fit in socially, like schizotypal. Then there's cluster B, which everybody knows about as the dramatic ones, so narcissistic, histrionic, and borderline. Everybody knows those. Then cluster C is stuff like avoidant, dependent, and this one, OCPD. So um, these, I don't remember why they're clustered, how they're clustered. You could Google it, but um, the, these ones make you very, it's real difficult difficult to deal with people, you know, and not in like the cute way, kind of like if you're borderline or narcissistic, you're really charming at first. This is not a cute disorder. It's not cute at all. So what it does is it makes you super rigid. It's not OCD where you have obsessions and compulsions, like you have to wash your hands a lot, or you keep thinking about, you know, uh, whether or not you're meant to be in your relationship, that's relationship OCD, or whatever. That's just intrusive thoughts and that's compulsions. That stuff responds well to Prozac and to exposure therapy with response prevention where you either imagine the bad thing or you actually stop yourself from doing the thing. Like if your thing is washing your hands, you stop yourself from washing your hands until your anxiety peaks and decreases. Anyway, a form of exposure therapy. And I'm not saying it's easy to treat OCD by any stretch, but it's not a person personality disorder. So it doesn't pervade every single aspect of your interactions with others in the same way that OCPD or any of the PDs do because they're personality disorders. So an obsessive compulsive personality disorder person is going to be super rigid. They're really into being on time. They're really into being frugal. They're really, it doesn't have to be everything, but it's most things. They're really into a moral code. They want to do the right thing all the time. They want want you to do the right thing all the time. They don't want to be corrected. It's their way or the highway, not in the way like casually, like people that are into themselves. Like this person gets extremely upset if they are not allowed to follow their rigid routine. So if they get up at six in the morning and somehow their alarm went off and they woke up at 602, they are going to freak the fuck out. Like they are not going to be, it's not going to be able, you're not gonna be able to deal with them. So this sort of, obviously as many uh, disorders are, there is a genetic loading. And there's also like the house that somebody grew up in. If they were raised to be super, super rigid, then they, you know, may turn into this too. And probably a parent is like this as well. So it's nature and nurture. If you are this kind of person and you grew up with a lot of restrictions and rules, then you really just think that that is the way that the world works best. And there's a lot of, of, um, 
you know, narcissism in this disorder, it may not be classic narcissism, but it's narcissistic in the way that they feel that their way is the only right way. And that it's much more about, they're focused more on the routines and the the productivity than they are on the relationship with the person. So somebody with a cluster B disorder like borderline or narcissism, they can understand that the relationship is paramount. They can under duress. So they could be very charming. They could be very sweet. Somebody with OCPD is not usually charming or sweet because they're too stressed out. They're, oh, they have to follow their rigid routine they feel no matter what. They do not feel that it's possible to not follow this routine but still have an efficient, effective life. So if you recognize this in your partner or your parent or yourself, I mean, obviously, let's tackle when it's not you first. So when it's not you, it's extremely difficult to live with this kind of person. And if you grew up with a parent who has OCPD, they also may have had um, like religious stuff going on where you had to all believe the same thing because there was only one right way and they got very upset if you challenged it. They don't like to be challenged or questioned in any way. And it can be very alienating to grow up with a parent who doesn't want to know any part of you uh, and is just fixated on that you do the right thing that looks the right way and then you, you only talk about it in a certain way. Most kids that grow up with a parent like this end up feeling pretty lonely uh, when interacting with that parent because it's so obvious that it's not about you. It's about whatever they need to happen getting done. So this could be very hard to grow up in such a household. Like similarly, it could be very hard to be married to such a person, obviously, because whether or not you have uh, X amount of gas in the tank that you're supposed to have, or whether or not you leave seven minutes to get to the doctor's appointment instead of eight minutes, this becomes a matter of major importance. And if, and if your belief system varies from their belief system or changes over time to vary, then that is also going to be taken taken as a personal offense and everything is very stressful so that's the key feeling when you're interacting with such a person as you could see in my linked uh, article about a woman who wrote in that her husband had OCPD so the the point here is that it is extremely difficult to live with these people but there are things that you could do to make it better and some of those involve your own boundaries so the first thing before you even get there is to understand that this is what you're dealing with. Because if this sounds right to you, then you could feel very validated. You could be like, oh my God, it's not that I myself am such a fuck up or so lazy or a slob or whatever. It's that this person has like impossible rigid standards and standards and are extraordinarily perfectionistic and uh, frequently not actually very efficient. They think they're very efficient, the people with OCPD, but in reality, their routines and stuff end up, A, taking more time than other more, you know, um, expeditious ways of dealing with things, and B, they are ruining a relationship. So a man with OCPD that really wants to save time all the time and save money all the time may end up divorced, which is a big expenditure of time and money because the wife can't even deal with him. So he can't even see, he can't see the forest for the trees, and that that is really the classic feeling of OCD, of OCPD rather, is not being able to see the forest for the trees. The trees are so important that you lose sight of the fact that, you know, the forest is burning. And by which I mean the relationship, you know, any interpersonal relationship that is on the line here. So first, you got to realize that this is what you're dealing with, which can in and of itself be very validating, particularly since many people have not even heard of this disorder because it is not super common and it's also very socially condoned. So these people get jobs where efficiency is prized and yeah, they're an asshole and uh, they can be rigid, but they're good at the job. The spreadsheet's always perfect. And so they do rise through the ranks in some ways, certainly not as they would if they were nicer and easier to deal with and had more social uh, ability, but they do have jobs and they do, you know, do well. And especially when the job involves being perfectionistic, like being a doctor or really a surgeon, something like that. A doctor, you know, usually has to have more bedside manner, talk to people. But if it's like, uh, 
uh, some really niche specialized thing where you have to do everything perfectly, then this is your person to do it. And um, it is very hard to feel like you are not the problem when this person who supposedly gets everything right all the time is telling you that your way is stupid and that your way is ineffective and inefficient, etc. And they frequently get very angry, these people, because they cannot tolerate disorder. So if you lead to some kind of disorder, even just by being slow or something or not on the mark with something... Here we go. It's a World War Three, you know. So this type of personality is very difficult to deal with. Understanding it is the first. And the second is that you have to learn to set very firm boundaries in terms of what behavior you will tolerate and not tolerate. So, for example, I will not tolerate you raising your voice at me. And then you got to follow through by, for example, leaving if they, the room or the apartment or whatever, if they do raise their voice at you. So because they're so rigid, these people can very easily learn when something is always going to go badly for them, they can learn not to do it because it, it, it ruins their day. I mean, if you, if, if they have to talk with you, have some kind of an interaction, a fight, and you're not going to do what they want if they yell at you, you know, they're eventually going to learn potentially not to yell at you because there is a reason. The reason isn't that you get upset. They're not going to think of it like that. But the reason is that they're still not going to get to do what they want to do. So if you are going to be late and uh, your husband yells at you, uh, get in here, you idiot, you're going to be late. Then you say, we talked about that. You can't call me an idiot. And then you don't get up and you really don't get up, you know, I mean, that's going to upset them. But then long term, they're going to realize if I call her an idiot, she's really not going to get in the car. Holy shit. That's this is terrible. So they can learn not to do that. So learning is hard when you are so activated, but over time they can learn that it is really never going to go their way, but it takes a strong person to really not capitulate. And when somebody's acting like a whirling dervish around you to not just get up and do whatever the hell they're doing. That's why couples counseling can really help you to assert your boundaries and to stand strong because otherwise you can be swept up in the tide of tremendous urgency and anxiety and rigidity and just get into the car even if the person called you an idiot. But that's not how you want to live your life, right? So the firm boundaries can help. And then also if this person, all personality disorders are not super easy to treat because they are more pervasive, but they are all treatable on some level. People are changeable. You know, I, again, I would be in the wrong profession if I did not believe that. They used to think that borderline personality was not changeable. It is, you know, and now narcissistic personality is, is the boogeyman of the moment. And that's changeable too, People work on that constantly. As long as they're not with a therapist who thinks that a diagnosis of NPD or narcissistic personality disorder is is the end of the world and, and a death sentence, then, yeah, of course, people work on being self-absorbed all the time in therapy. That's like a major part of evolving as a human being. And same with OCPD. People can learn to be more flexible if they have the motivation to do so. And a lot of motivation comes from thinking you're going to lose your family and because your wife or your husband is going to leave you. And with parents, the, you know, you got a little bit less traction there. So if you're an adult child of a parent with OCPD, these are, these are frequently situations where people try to go lower contact because it is so stressful to interact with this person that it, it's just not worth it. But again, if the person is motivated enough to respond and change in certain ways, sometimes they can. And people with OCPD need real direct communication. Things like, you cannot raise your voice above a speaking tone or I will have to leave this house and this meal. So if it happens one time, they do. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of people try to not hurt the person's feelings. Listen, this person does not have as many feelings as you, the person whose feelings are getting hurt. This person's feelings are hidden below the surface of lots and lots of surface level anxiety that's creating so much noise that you need to speak loudly and firmly to get through it. So much like with narcissists, I always advise if you're going to set a boundary, do not worry about hurting the person's feelings. Just be very, very clear. This is not a little shrinking violet person. You have to say something super clear in order to give them 
any shot of hearing you. Not the way you would want somebody to talk to you. Not that way. So a different way that you think is rude, that you would feel was rude if somebody talked to you like that, that is how you have to set boundaries with these more difficult personality disorders, such as OCPD or a narcissistic personality. You need to say things like, I will not tolerate you speaking to me like that. You cannot use the word idiot. That's very clear. You know, and if the person does use the word idiot in this example, you would have to leave. You would have to leave the room or do whatever you say you're going to do. Now, what if you are the person with OCPD? Well, then you've recognized yourself. <laughs> and now, it, it, if, if you have the, the insight and the psychological mindedness, as we call it, the awareness of psychological variables and interest in them, to be listening to this podcast or somebody sent it to you and you've listened to it, then, you know, you can stop this by working deeply in therapy on why you are so rigid. It's likely a combination of genetics. You had a rigid parent and the fact that you were raised by that rigid parent, you know? And so that's nature and nurture. And if you realize that this you are going to ruin your life, e.g. your spouse is going to leave, your kids are going to hate you by being so rigid, then truly you can work on stopping. Frequently, ironically, it's by enacting some different sorts of rituals. You know, like every Tuesday I go to therapy and I bring a list of all the things that my wife got upset at me about. And we go through them and we see what could I have done differently. That is a major step to a lot of people. To some people, that sounds like very uh, rote and that it would be uh, unappealing. But to somebody who thinks in this way, that is feels like you're getting something done. And truly, you are. And the other obvious downside to having this disorder is a profound lack of empathy. So I refer you back to my empathy podcast which could be very useful because if you have this issue, it's uh, almost 100% that somebody in your life has been like, why don't you see what I mean? Can't you see you're hurting my feelings? Or something to indicate that you have a profound lack of empathy. And perspective taking is tough when you are constantly suffused by tremendous simmering anxiety, almost rage over the fact that nobody's as efficient as you. It's a hard place to be in. Of course, this isn't real. It isn't real that you're the only, uh, you know, efficient person on the planet and it isn't real that you have the best possible routines out of any of the billions of people in the world you have figured out how to get out in the morning efficiently more than anyone else could like that's not real you know with work you can see that that is not real and that as a lot of anxiety is it's a defense mechanism against a profound fear of loss of control such that you give yourself an illusion that you're in control to beat back fear of not being in control because none of us are in control. I'm sitting in my car right now and a meteor could strike me dead from the heavens, right? So since none of us have any control, people with va- in, in various ways try to work against that, um, you know, by thinking about various other positive things such as, well, I may die at any moment, but I know I can get out in the morning in 16 and a half minutes. <laughs> so they don't articulate it with the, you know, fear of mortality, but that's really what it is. That's what most anxiety is, is a fear of loss of control. And then you create the illusion of control in various ways, frequently ways that upset other people because they make you into an asshole to deal with. So if you, if this podcast resonates with you because you have somebody in your life like this, then it is also honestly a good idea to talk to your own therapist about processing uh, some of your resentment. Because again, these people are difficult to deal with. And you have your own resentment and there's reasons that you pick to have these people in your life or else you didn't pick if they're a parent, in which case you're processing uh, family of origin issues. And or if you're married to such an individual, then couples counseling may be very useful because it may be a time that they say, well, shit, I'm here. I have to be here. I'm here for 45 minutes. So I want to get ways to deal with this. And, um, and some of them may be beating back the defensiveness originally, but eventually it is likely that people can meet in some sort of middle. You know, there's all kinds of middle. <laughs> the middle just has to be maybe uh, instead of you giving 99% and them giving 1%, you could end up giving 75% and they give 25%. But that's going to feel a hell of a lot better in your marriage. Of course, 50-50 is uh, wonderful. But, you know, that's math. That's not reality. Any change would feel significant if you're in this situation. All right. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast and the introduction to a personality disorder that you probably did not know. And um, I will talk to everybody soon. Please subscribe.